Hello and welcome to another episode of Reading Together from Seaharp Press. I'm Eugene Lunning, co-founder of Seaharp, and today we'll be continuing our journey through C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. We've been in book three, we've already gotten through four chapters, and today we're coming upon a chapter that is going to, of course, be quite intense and deep. It's entitled Sexual Morality, and this is chapter five. We must now consider Christian morality as regards sex, what Christians call the virtue of chastity. The Christian rule of chastity must not be confused with the social rule of modesty, in one sense of that word, i.e. propriety or decency. The social rule of propriety lays down how much of the human body should be displayed and what subjects can be referred to and in what words according to the customs of a given social circle. Thus, while the rule of chastity is the same for all Christians at all times, the rule of propriety changes. A girl in the Pacific Islands wearing hardly any clothes and a Victorian lady completely covered in clothes might both be equally modest, proper, or decent according to the standards of their own societies, and both for all we could tell by their dress, might be equally chaste or equally unchaste. Some of the language which chaste women used in Shakespeare's time would have been used in the 19th century, oh, century only by a woman completely abandoned. When people break the rule of propriety current in their own time and place, if they do so in order to excite lust in themselves or others, then they are offending against chastity. But if they break it through ignorance or carelessness, they are guilty only of bad manners. When, as often happens, they break it defiantly in order to shock or embarrass others, they are not necessarily being unchaste, but they are being uncharitable. For it is uncharitable to take pleasure in making other people uncomfortable I do not think that a very strict or fussy standard of propriety is any proof of chastity or any help to it, and I therefore regard the great relaxation and simplifying of the rule which has taken place in my own lifetime as a good thing. At its present stage, however, it has this inconvenience, that people of different ages and different types do not all acknowledge the same standard, and we hardly know where we are. While this confusion lasts, I think that old or old-fashioned people should be very careful not to assume that young or emancipated people are corrupt whenever they are, by the old standard, improper, and in return, that young people should not call their elders prudes or puritans because they do not easily adopt the new standard. A real desire to believe all the good you can of others and to make others as comfortable as you can will solve most of the problems. Well, friends, obviously, as we get to a chapter called Sexual Morality, and as you are listening to this many years after the days of Lewis's life and the recordings of these words, well, I just want to point out to you that where things are is, frankly, infinitely worse than it was in his day. Of course, people had sexual instincts in his day. People were sexually in, you know, impropriety kind of moments in their lives. And yet the sexualization of culture and of really personhood had not even really begun to begin at this point. You've heard me reference, I think it was in our last series, the Kinsey Report that came out, sort of this psychological understanding of the human being as being defined as a sexual being. I believe that happened somewhere around this time frame, but its ramifications had not spun out yet. So as we dive into this chapter, I want to point out something that I've pointed out before. We were created for sexual pleasure. We were created for it within the bounds God has given to it. And everything outside of those bounds tends to not only corrupt, but also to make our lives completely out of control. Lust has this unbelievable ability to imbalance us, to make us people who are outside of our wits. And so as Lewis goes into this idea of morality, as I often do, I want to always bring it back to the personal level. 
to the reality that you and I are trying to follow Jesus. And we want to do it with cool heads, with the ability to focus our attentions. And so when the sexuality and the sexualization around us tends to overwhelm us, we have a hard time keeping that cool mind. So let's have kind of open hearts, non-judgment, as we've been called to in Jesus, but also clear heads. Let's really listen to what Lewis is saying and pay attention to the things that have not changed at all, given many passings of decades. Chastity is the most unpopular of the Christian virtues. There is no getting away from it. The Christian rule is either marriage with complete faithfulness to your partner or else total abstinence. Now, this is so difficult and so contrary to our instincts that obviously either Christianity is wrong or our sexual instinct, as it now is, has gone wrong. One or the other. Of course, being a Christian, I think it is the instinct which has gone wrong. But I have other reasons for thinking so. The biological purpose of sex is children, just as the biological purpose of eating is to repair the body. Now, if we eat whenever we feel inclined and just as much as we want, it is quite true most of us will eat too much, but not terrifically too much. One man may eat enough for two, but he does not eat enough for ten. The appetite goes a little beyond its biological purpose, but not enormously. But if a healthy young man indulged his sexual appetite whenever he felt inclined, and if each act produced a baby, then in ten years he might easily populate a small village. This appetite is in ludicrous and preposterous excess of its function. Or take it another way. You can get a large audience together for a striptease act, that is, to watch a girl undress on the stage. Now suppose you come to a country where you could fill a theater by simply bringing a covered plate onto the stage and then slowly lifting the cover so as to let everyone see, just before the lights went out, that it contained a mutton chop or a bit of bacon. Would you not think that in that country something had gone wrong with the appetite for food? And would not anyone who had grown up in a different world think there was something equally strange about the state of the sex instinct among us? Something in those last couple of paragraphs that I'd like to point out. I love this question. This is so difficult, meaning to have chastity, to have self-control with regards to sexuality. This is so difficult and so contrary to our instincts that obviously either Christianity is wrong or our sexual instinct, as it now is, has gone wrong. Can you see the demarcation there he's given it? He's not actually putting it on the footing of either Christianity is wrong or our instincts are wrong. He says either Christianity is wrong or our instincts have gone wrong. It does not mean that our sexual desire is itself wrong, Lewis says. It's that it has gone wrong. It has been twisted, turned, made into something that it's not meant to be for our highest and best. That is a very important point to pay attention to as we continue. One critic said that if he found a country in which such striptease acts with food were popular, he would conclude that the people of that country were starving. He meant, of course, to imply that such things as the striptease act resulted not from sexual corruption, but from sexual starvation. I agree with him that if, in some strange land, we found that similar acts with mutton chops were popular, one of the possible explanations which would occur to me would be famine. But the next step would be to test our hypothesis by finding out whether, in fact, much or little food was being consumed in that country. If the evidence showed that a good deal was being eaten, then, of course, we should have to abandon the hypothesis of starvation and try to think of another one. In the same way, before accepting sexual starvation as the cause of the striptease, we should have to look for evidence that there is, in fact, more sexual abstinence in our age than in those ages when things like the striptease were unknown. But surely there is no such evidence. Contraceptives have made sexual indulgence far less costly within marriage and far safer outside it than ever before, and 
public opinion is less hostile to illicit unions and even to perversion than it has been since pagan times. Nor is the hypothesis of starvation the only one we can imagine. Everyone knows that the sexual appetite, like our other appetites, grows by indulgence. Starving men may think much about food, but so do gluttons, the gorged as well as the famished, like titillations. This is a fascinating thing to point out. Because a lot of times, and I'll speak to our country, the United States of America, in which I happen to live, a lot of times people will point back to things like, you know, Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter and say, see, back in those times when people were such prudes, well, sexual things had to just find their way. And so we point to our current day where it's completely okay to do anything you want. And we assume that this is better. We assume that the starvation of the past was the problem and not the fact that there's just something about the instinct that's gone wrong again. Because I think we can look around at our current day, as I record this in 2023, and say, well, it does not appear that we have a sexually healthy society, just in terms of the way that people are hurt by said sexuality. So to Lewis's point, it's probably not the case that starvation is our issue. It's again this idea that our instincts have gone wrong. And I want to point this out. It's not our instinct writ large, meaning it's not necessarily our cultural instinct that's gone wrong. It's individuals who have given in to that instinct gone wrong, again, writ large. It's this thing that is an individual giving in to what they believe to be the atmosphere of their day that then turns into a terrifically bad atmosphere of our day. It's sort of circular in a way, which I hope I didn't just make completely muddled as I explained that. I'll keep reading. Here is a third point. You find very few people who want to eat things that really are not food or to do other things with food instead of eating it. In other words, perversions of the food appetite are rare. But perversions of the sex instinct are numerous, hard to cure, and frightful. I'm sorry to have to go into all these details, but I must. The reason why I must is that you and I, for the last 20 years, have been fed all day long on good solid lies about sex. We have been told, till one is sick of hearing it, that sexual desire is in the same state as any of our other natural desires, and that, if only we abandon the silly old Victorian idea of hushing it up, everything in the garden will be lovely. It is not true. The moment you look at the facts and away from the propaganda, you see that it is not. They tell you sex has become a mess because it was hushed up. But for the last 20 years, it has not been. It has been chattered about all day long, yet it is still in a mess. If hushing up had been the cause of the trouble, ventilation would have set it right, but it has not. I think it is the other way around. I think the human race originally hushed it up because it had become such a mess. Modern people are always saying, sex is nothing to be ashamed of. They may mean two things. They may mean there is nothing to be ashamed of in the fact that the human race reproduces itself in a certain way, nor in the fact that it gives pleasure. If they mean that, they are right. Christianity says the same. It is not the thing nor the pleasure that is the trouble. The old Christian teacher said that if man had never fallen, sexual pleasure, instead of being less than it is now, would actually have been greater. I know some muddle-headed Christians have talked as if Christianity thought that sex or the body or pleasure were bad in themselves. But they were wrong. Christianity is almost the only one of the great religions which thoroughly approves of the body, which believes that matter is good that God himself once took on a human body, that some kind of body is going to be given to us even in heaven and is going to be an essential part of our happiness or beauty and our energy. Christianity has glorified marriage more than any other religion, and nearly all the greatest love poetry in the world has been produced by Christians. 
If anyone says that sex in itself is bad, Christianity contradicts him at once. But of course, when people say sex is nothing to be ashamed of, they may mean the state into which, <clears throat> pardon me, the state into which the sexual instinct has now got is nothing to be ashamed of. And I'm going to pause there because what is so fascinating that Lewis is pointing out here is not just about sexuality. Of all the ways, whether it's Buddhism, Hinduism, um, Islam, of all the ways that humankind has attempted to get toward uh, whatever Godhead they're attempting to get toward, well, he's not wrong. Christianity is one of the few that actually takes account of the body positively. It says that within the bounds of marriage, this beautiful thing called sex is to be enjoyed. I mean, just look at like Song of Songs. And we are not told that we need to go out there and all become like these hermits or anchorites who are hiding away from humanity. In fact, that sometimes is the strain of Christianity that's the most irksome, that's out there and away from people not carrying the gospel and saying that the body is evil. Lewis is saying to us, no! Jesus took on a body to actually show us what can be done, how it can be lived in such a way that it honors God and is brought to a place of being holy, set apart. So I love that Lewis is broaching this, not only for this sexual morality chapter, but for the living of life. We're actually meant to take pleasure in the way that God has made us to be for his purposes. This is a very high holy thought. I'm going to go on. If they mean that, meaning what he just said, that the way that sexual instincts have been allowed to uh, kind of continue and, and, and grow and to become the center of humanity. If they mean that, I think they are wrong. I think it is everything to be ashamed of. There is nothing to be ashamed of in enjoying your food. There would be everything to be ashamed of if half the world made food the main interest of their lives and spent their times looking at pictures of food and dribbling and smacking their lips. I do not say you and I are individually responsible for the present situation. Our ancestors have handed over to us organisms which are warped in this respect, and we grow up surrounded by propaganda in favor of unchastity. There are people who want to keep our sex instinct inflamed in order to make money out of us. Because, of course, a man with an obsession is a man who has very little sales resistance. God knows our situation. He will not judge us as if we had no difficulties to overcome. What matters is the sincerity and perseverance of our will to overcome them. Before we can be cured, we must want to be cured. Those who really wish for help will get it. But for many modern people, even the wish is difficult. It is easy to think that we want something when we do not really want it. A famous Christian long ago told us that when he was a young man, he prayed constantly for chastity. But years later, he realized that while his lips had been saying, Oh Lord, make me chaste, his heart had been secretly adding, But please don't do it just yet. This may happen in prayers for other virtues too, but there are three reasons why it is now specially difficult for us to desire, let alone to achieve complete chastity. Now, before he gets to that tripartite argument for why we sometimes struggle to even begin to want to begin the cure, I do want to point something out. I am obviously a man, and I have lots of friends and who are men. And, and I want to say, whenever I'm in a pretty serious men's group Bible study retreat setting, it is invariably the case that we will get around to what people would call an, an addiction to pornography. And one thing I want to say to you, assuming that maybe you are a man, you could be a woman also struggling with that. I just want to say this right now before we get to Lewis's three-part argument here, that there actually is freedom on offer. I think that there is something going on in our modern-day church atmosphere that says that once you're addicted, you will always be an addict. It's sort of the AA approach to lust, to pornography, that sort of thing. But I just want to put it before you that your desire to be set free is actually in the right direction. 
you are not meant to be a slave to this. This is not something that you will, quote, have to battle for the rest of your life. Let's go to him. Let's go and ask that he would almost turn off kind of that desire, that illicit desire to go and to look at things that are really, really harmful to our hearts for him. Friends, there's freedom on offer. I just want to get that in front of you before we go back to Lewis. So believe me, that is what is on offer. I'll continue now. In the first place, our warped natures, the devils who tempt us, and all the contemporary propaganda for lust combine to make us feel that the desires we are resisting are so natural, so healthy, and so reasonable that it is almost perverse and abnormal to resist them. Poster after poster, film after film, novel after novel, associate the idea of sexual indulgence with the ideas of health, normality, youth, frankness, and good humor. Now, this association is a lie. Like all powerful lies, it is based on a truth. The truth, acknowledged above, that sex in itself, apart from the excesses and obsessions that have grown round it, is normal and healthy and all the rest of it. The lie consists in the suggestion that any sexual act to which you are tempted at the moment is also healthy and normal. Now this, on any conceivable view, and quite apart from Christianity, must be nonsense. Surrender to all our desires obviously leads to impotence, disease, jealousies, lies, concealment, and everything that is the reverse of health, good humor, and frankness. For any happiness, even in this world, quite a lot of restraint is going to be necessary. So the claim made by every desire, when it is strong, to be healthy and reasonable counts for nothing. Every sane and civilized man must have some set of principles by which he chooses to reject some of his desires and to permit others. One man does this on Christian principles, another on hygienic principles, another on sociological principles. The real conflict is not between Christianity and nature, but between Christian principles and other principles in the control of nature. For nature, in the sense of natural desire, will have to be controlled anyway, unless you are going to ruin your whole life. The Christian principles are, admittedly, stricter than the others. But then we, but then we think you will get help towards obeying them, which you will not get towards obeying the others. I do think this is interesting here, because he keeps circling back to the actual like natural instinct that we do feel, but then he points out that even in a completely logical sense, that if we give ourselves over to our instinct, that that will in fact draw us into a greater hunger after its fruits. So it becomes a question of what kind of people do we want to be? And he's even pointing out here, not even necessarily in the Christian context, but just as people. How do we want to define ourselves? To what do we want to be pointing the purpose of our lives day by day by day? These are great kind of logical considerations. Back to his three arguments. He's coming to the second. In the second place, many people are deterred from seriously attempting Christian chastity because they think, before trying, that it is impossible. But when a thing has to be attempted, one must never think about possibility or impossibility. Faced with an optional question in an examination paper, one considers whether one can do it or not. Faced with a compulsory question, one must do the best one can. You may get some marks for a very imperfect answer. You will certainly get none for leaving the question alone. Not only in examinations, but in war, in mountain climbing, in learning to skate or swim or ride a bicycle, even in fastening a stiff collar with cold fingers. People quite often do what seemed impossible before they did it. It is wonderful what you can do when you have to. We may be indeed, we may indeed be sure that perfect chastity, like 
perfect charity, will not be attained by any merely human efforts. You must ask for God's help. Even when you have done so, it may seem to you for a long time that no help or less help than you need is being given. Never mind. After each failure, ask forgiveness, pick yourself up, and try again. Very often, what God first helps us towards is not the virtue itself, but just this power of always trying again. For however important chastity or courage or truthfulness or any other virtue may be, this process trains us in habits of the soul, which are more important still. It cures our illusions about ourselves and teaches us to depend on God. We learn, on the one hand, that we cannot trust ourselves even in our best moments, and on the other, that we need not despair even in our worst, for our failures are forgiven. The only fatal thing is to sit down content with anything less than perfection. And boy, have we hit on this a lot, not only in this chapter, but elsewhere. The reality of the grace of Jesus is that repentance must be our first recourse no matter our sin. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. That is not a cheapening of grace. It is making use of the grace which we have been provided. So whether you are desperately struggling sexually even today, and maybe an hour ago you fell short in some way, what are you called to do? To sit down, as he says here, content with anything less than perfection? Or to go the other direction and to sit in your shame and become useless in the kingdom economy? No, friends! In any way that you fall short, you are to come back to the feet of Jesus and to look him in the eye and to say, I am so sorry. That is not who you have called me to be. Would you please forgive me and make me new all over again so that I can follow you today? Friends, in this sexual sphere and in the midst of a whole culture that says to us it's foolish to even try, I want to remind you that your failure is not a complete failure. Your failure may be, let's call it a stepping stone, right back to his presence. You fell short. Now confess it. Receive his forgiveness and move back into following him. That's not a command from me. That's a command from him. Back to Lewis's three arguments. Thirdly, people often misunderstand what psychology teaches about repressions. It teaches us that repressed sex is dangerous. But repressed here is a technical term. It does not mean suppressed in the sense of denied or resisted. A repressed desire or thought is one which has been thrust into the subconscious, usually at a very early age, and can now come before the mind only in a disguised and unrecognizable form. Repressed sexuality does not appear to the patient to be sexuality at all. When an adolescent or an adult is engaged in resisting a conscious desire, he is not dealing with a repression, nor is he in the least danger of creating a repression. On the contrary, those who are seriously attempting chastity are more conscious and soon know a great deal more about their own sexuality than anyone else. They come to know their desires as Wellington knew Napoleon, or as Sherlock Holmes knew Moriarty, as a rat catcher knows rats or a plumber knows about leaky pipes. Virtue, even attempted virtue, brings light. Indulgence brings fog. Wow, that is a fascinating and brilliant way to turn as we get to the end of this chapter. It's our actually pay, paying attention to our desires. It's naming them. It's bringing them out into the light that brings clarity. So I talked before, and I was open about saying, I, I have so many friends who come to me with this fear about their addiction to pornography. But I love that they're bringing it out into the light and saying, I have this desire to be about something that I know is not the highest and best for me. Friends, we have to do this. We have to examine those things that are drawing us in the wrong direction. Name it and say, I don't want that, Lord Jesus. Because virtue, even attempted virtue, is bringing it into the light, to the light. 
Friends, it is indulgence that brings fog. It's indulgence that creates that sort of uh, personal moral relativism that then takes us in all kinds of terrible directions. We want to be clear about what we're trying to do, and we want to be clear about it not only with ourselves, not only with our brothers and sisters, but with the Lord Jesus. All right, last paragraph. Finally, though I have had to speak at some length about sex, I want to make it as clear as I possibly can that the center of Christian morality is not here. It's not here, he's telling us. If anyone thinks that Christians regard unchastity as the supreme vice, he is quite wrong. The sins of the flesh are bad, but they are the least bad of all sins. All the worst pleasures are purely spiritual. The pleasure of putting other people in the wrong, of bossing and patronizing and spoiling sport and backbiting, the pleasures of power, of hatred. For there are two things inside me, competing with the human self, which I must try to become. They are the animal self and the diabolical self. The diabolical self is the worst of the two. That is why a cold, self-righteous prig who goes regularly to church may be far nearer to hell than a prostitute. But of course, it is better to be neither. And so right here where I want to close is a place that I may even have referenced recently in these series, but it's a place where I was just returning yet again. It's to John 8. It is to that moment with the woman who has been caught in the act of adultery, who is brought before Jesus, probably almost stark nude, and has stood before a crowd to be shamed. Those religious leaders of the day assuredly are looking upon her with lust in that moment. And yet as they look to Jesus, as they look for a way to accuse him, they say, well, in our religious law, she deserves to die. Now, what do you say? And what does he do? What does he do for you when you have fallen short sexually? He stoops down. He writes in the sand. He draws the attention of humanity away from our external acts of disobedience and to himself. Friends, that's what I'm encouraging you to do. Whether you are struggling sexually of late or whether this is just something you are tempted to judge in other people. Our call is to focus upon him. Our call, as he does so brilliantly, is to draw our hearts to our own selves and to say, am I perfect? Well, no. So whether you are struggling to judge other people or you are struggling sexually, I remind you as we close this chapter that the thing for you to be about is a complete focus, a complete fascination on the person of Jesus. It's the way that he treated the prostitutes that gives you a sense of how he wants to treat all of us in our sexual struggles or in our temptation to judge. We have been in a rather long chapter in book three of C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, and I hope that in some way this has been helpful to you, at the very least, as Lewis said, to bring this out into the light, to make it a subject of conversation, not of shame so that you and I can focus our full attention back upon him. Thanks for joining me in this wonderful book. I look forward to our next episode, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.